February 26th, 1963. It's the height of the Cold War. John F. Kennedy is the President of the United States. Nikita Khrushchev is the General Secretary of the Soviet Union. Konrad Adenauer is the Chancellor of West Germany. And Olaf Thors is the Prime Minister of Iceland. The Cuban Missile Crisis happens just a few weeks prior and the movie To Kill a Mockingbird has just hit theaters. In Reykjavik, a Soviet embassy staffer and an Icelandic truck driver get into a small civilian car and drive eastwards out of the city. But unbeknownst to one of the men, their every move is being watched. Ragnar Gunnarsson was born in 1933. During his teenage years he joined the Icelandic Socialist Youth Organization, known as Eiskulisvikingin, and during the 1950s he and several other Icelandic Socialist students traveled to the Soviet Union in order to get a first-hand experience of the gloriousness of life under socialism. Somewhat ironically, but very understandably, many of the students who went on these educational trips east ended up getting very disillusioned by what they saw. They witnessed crippling poverty, extreme restrictions of basic freedoms, and just the incredibly depressing mundaneness of everyday Soviet life. Many of these students ended up returning to Iceland and swearing of socialism forever. Now, Ragnar was not one of those who became completely disillusioned with socialism. He later recalled that while he did find many flaws in uh, the Soviet way of life, he also greatly admired Soviet society and its many accomplishments. After his time in the Soviet Union, he returned to Reykjavik and started his own trucking company. He also continued to be a frequent guest at the Mir, that's the Menningar Tengsla Setur Islands og Rástjórnar Ríkjana or the Cultural Exchange Office of Iceland and the Soviet Union. I wonder how that would be acronymed. The C-O-E I-S-U Mir is fine. It was at Mir where Ragnar would come into contact with two Soviet embassy staffers Kisiliev and Dmitriev the two Russians were apparently aware that uh, Ragnar's trucking company wasn't going too well, so they decided to offer their help to a fellow socialist in exchange for a small favor of their own. Ah, oh, gosh, what a nice couple of chaps. The two men wanted Ragnar to get a job at the NATO airbase at Keplavik and secretively take photos of military aircraft and other hardware. Ragnar, however, refused. He did not want to take part in anything illegal for them. However, over the next several months, uh, Kiseliev and Dmitriev would frequently visit Ragnar and pr try to pressure him into working for them. They offered him large sums of money. At one point, they even left him 4,000 kroner on his living room table. The man continued to try to push Ragnar into their service, so eventually he simply couldn't take it any longer and decided to notify the police in Reykjavik. Upon hearing Ragnar's story, the police took it initially with a little bit of skepticism. The investigation department of the Reykjavik police realized that the matter was very delicate since both Kisiliev and uh, Dmitriev were officially diplomats. The police set up a surveillance operation in order to monitor the two men and to find out their exact motives. Unfortunately, the investigation department at the time did not possess any proper surveillance equipment. However, the police were still able to employ some incredibly advanced surveillance tactics and methods. Methods that were so advanced so discreet that no amount of Soviet GRU training could have ever prepared Dmitriev and Kisiliev for what was about to unfold. For example, when Ragnar's contact in the police found out that the two Russians were going to pay Ragnar a visit later that evening, two investigators hurried over to Ragnar's apartment, 
and hid inside the bathroom. Then when the Russians entered and sat down in Ragnar's living room, the two investigators simply listened to their conversation through the door. No, I am not making that up. That actually happened. By now, Njörður Snæholm was convinced that Ragnar was telling the exact truth. They had also found out that the Russians were soon planning to set up a meeting with Ragnar somewhere out of the city, and it was believed that on this meeting they would give Ragnar his final instructions on how to properly spy for them. So the police very hastily set up a sting operation. Through Ragnar they had been able to find out that the Russians were most likely planning to set up the meeting at Havrava, which is uh, just outside the city. Well, back then it was a bit further outside of the city. So one of the two Russians knocked on Ragnar's door and asked if he was willing to take a drive with him out of the city towards Havrava, where they would meet with the other Russian, and Ragnar agreed. So they got into Ragnar's car, with Ragnar pr himself driving, and drove off. But unbeknownst to the Russian, there were two policemen hiding behind their seats. And by the way, Ragnar's car was a British-made Morris 8, and those are quite small. But the Russian simply didn't notice. Thank goodness these guys aren't going up against James Bond. <laughs> so they drove over to Havrava, where the other Russian was waiting outside of his car. The car was a Ford Taunus 12M. He had apparently chosen a western-made car because he thought a Russian model would be too uh, conspicuous. So Ragnar and the Russian arrive on Ragnar's Morris, and as he is parking his car, one of the two Russians finally notices that there are two people hiding in the back seat. Then, the two investigators uh, jumped out of the car and gave a signal. And before the Russians had fully realized exactly what was going on, uniformed police were jumping out from their hiding spots all around and had quickly encircled the two cars. While interrogating the two spies, the Russians pointed out that they did in fact have diplomatic immunity, so they could not arrest them. Njörður Snæholm agreed, however, said that their uh, diplomatic status would probably be revoked the next day. The Russians agreed, and after that the police released them, and the Russians did in fact fly out of the country the very next day, and that was that. Icelandic journalists attempted to get some answers from the Soviet embassy in Reykjavik about uh, Dmitriev's and Kisiliev's exploits in Iceland. Now, the embassy simply claimed that they were simply cultural attaches, and all evidence of them spying was simply fabricated by anti-Soviet actors in Iceland that were working on behalf of the Americans. Really, Ivan? That's the best thing you can come up with? So that was the true story of how Reykjavik police apprehended two Soviet spies during the Cold War. Now, is it possible, perhaps, that the Russians were able to press some other Icelander into their service, or perhaps several Icelanders, and set Icelanders and their spy masters were just never caught? We'll never find out, will we?